Good evening, everyone. My name is Sandra Collins, and I'm the director of the National Library of Ireland. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this opening event in our Border Literature series. The National Library has been central to the initiatives around the decade of centenaries because of our unparalleled collections, which are a key resource for the history of this island. We see border literatures as an excellent opportunity to add literary perspectives to conversations around the centenary of partition. As Ireland's memory keeper, the National Library is delighted to offer you this series examining the idea and the realities of borders as they are explored in literature. We are keenly aware that there is no single story of Ireland and that conversation between interested and interesting people remains one of the best models for sharing different perspectives and for situating the Irish experience within broader cultural contexts. This series has been curated for us by Professor Nicholas Allen. Nicholas holds an endowed professorship in the humanities at the University of Georgia, where he directs the Wilter Wilson Center for Humanities and Arts. He's an author and an editor of many books about Ireland, the most recent of which are Archipelago, A Reader, which is just published by Lily Push in September 2021 uh, with Fiona Stafford, and Ireland, Literature and the Coast, Sea Tangled, by Oxford 2020. Nicholas is also a great friend of the National Library. So all of that makes it an absolute special pleasure to welcome him now and all our panel this evening. And I'm delighted to hand over to you now, Nicholas. Thanks so much, Sandra. And thanks so much to all your colleagues at the National Library and to Brefni O'Malley who did so much to help get this organized uh, series underway. And I'd just like to pay special credit to you, Sandra, to Dr. Collins for the great leadership of the National Library and the acquisition of manuscripts in the broadening out of the audiences of the library and of really giving a sense of energy and direction to the whole place. So brava, Sandra, we all appreciate you very much. I also want to thank everyone who's going to take part in the conversations about border literatures in the coming year. And to thank you for joining us this evening from around the world. You're all very welcome. The conversation is being recorded, and if you have a question, please enter it in the Q&A function, and I'll do my very best at the end to include it, time permitting. And as we begin, I'd like to encourage you to engage with the ongoing series that Queen's University Belfast is undertaking on partition, along with the many other initiatives at public institutions like the Royal Irish Academy, with its just announced scheme for all Ireland collaborations are undertaking. 25 years ago, I left Belfast for Dublin and found freedom in my education in Irish literature. Sitting under the imperial dome of what is now the National Library, I read through the O'Brien pamphlet collection, the crumbling pages of the Irish homestead, the first editions of books that didn't go into a second. It struck me then that if history is a partial account of what was, literature is a version of what might still be. This is one reason why the literary has become the poor relation of the historical in Ireland's decade of centenaries, Centenaries that would have nothing to mark if poetry, song, and theatre had not summoned alternative resistant forms in the first place. The issue becomes acute on the island of Ireland with the centenary of partition, with its messy, particular beginnings and its unresolved global consequences. Beginnings and endings that make it impossible to think of any one centenary at all, but a fracture that has proliferated, a crack in the looking glass cracking into more are reflections on this present past, fragmentary and partial. In its way, this reflection is true to the irregularity of so much of this island's late imperial experience, which extends into both into what separates us by misunderstanding, north and south, and into what we share in the partial and regulated freedoms afforded by both states, in which liberty and life was circumscribed for so many by gender, religion, class and language. Our conversation today will share stories of borders in Europe, Asia, and Africa in contexts of literary, political, cultural, and religious ideas. We will not say that all partitions are the same or even equivalent, but we'll begin with what we recognize in each other's personal embodied experience of borderlands as a way to approach larger questions of belonging, 
and separation through narratives that center the humane in contexts of sometimes near unimaginable suffering. Partition has frequently been a practice of provisional fiction, a single ending imposed on multiple narratives. Perhaps in response, this is why I, like so many others who grew up in the Troubles, turned to books for solidarity and escape. I have missed this texture of Kieran Carson and Sinead Morrissey, of Anna Burns and Seamus Heaney and the commemorative centenaries, literature and art of disquiet, history and adjunct to conclusion, a performance of ending deaf to the continuing present. Beginning this evening with Garrett Carr, Katka Kasabova, Suchitra Vijayan and Donal Hassett, and I'm so grateful and delighted that you're with us today. I couldn't think of four better and people that be start this conversation. We're going to talk about border literatures as an art of the unfinished and hope that we might find among the debris of the last century, a language of empathy and comparison that can say the unsaid, welcome the unwelcome and think the unthinkable, a literature without borders. So to begin with Katka, who very kindly has joined us this evening from Paris, where she is to celebrate the publication of her latest book to the lake for which warmest congratulations you wrote in borders so hauntingly of place and past of these forest zones into which people traveled and sometimes didn't come out from and i wonder could you start us in the conversation by just sharing with us a little about your experience of borders for the first time and how those early experiences have changed over time in your process of writing and reflection but thank you Katkin. Thank you so much for including me in this important conversation. It's <clears throat> I'm delighted, delighted to be part of it. Thank you. Um, thank you all for being with us. Um, we can't really see each other very much, but uh, um, <clears throat> uh, thank you, Nicholas, for this wonderful, um, inspiring overview of what it is we are trying to, uh, yes, say the answer sayable, think the unthinkable. Um, I, I guess um, most things that accompany us through our lives um, as writers and readers begin, uh, begin in childhood. And for me, certainly the, the relationship that I have with, with borders began in, in childhood, probably before, before I could articulate um, before I even heard the word border. Um, and as a child growing up behind the Iron Curtain, I was very aware of, um, very aware of the fact that movement was one directional, that, um, you know, people could come to us, but we couldn't leave, we couldn't, um, we couldn't cross, cross our borders. So this feeling of growing up in a kind of open air prison, accompanied me and I think my, my generation um, through our childhood. And we were, we came of age, my generation, um, just as the Berlin Wall came, came down. So really, I, th I think I was always going to write about borders. And, and for me, borders are not necessarily something physical because I first experienced the Iron Curtain as not something physical. You couldn't actually visit, um, the militarized border zone, which was vast. It wasn't just that particular, um, it wasn't just the fence. It was called uh, then the installation. That was the official kind of um, language for it, the, in, the border installation. Um, you couldn't actually visit that militarized zone within 30 kilometers or so of the actual border. So that was a vast stretch of um, a stretch of territory. So yes, for me, the border experience began as an emotional experience of separation from the world, but also separation from the truth because the border was taboo, you couldn't even talk about it. So that's, that's really how it began for me. And in approaching that border of my childhood, of, um, of everybody's childhood in, in Eastern Europe, I was really, it, it was an attempt to, to begin to articulate, not just in my own voice, but through the voices of the people of the border, um, those, those sort of early uh, formative, um, primal, I think, spectrum of experiences and feelings and relationships and secrets and lies. Um, 
Yeah, I thought that was one thing that Border does beautifully. It almost makes theatrical the staging of reportage that you have so many voices of people that you speak with who say things that you wouldn't always expect. But the way that you orchestrated the voices almost made a, a kind of a, a theater, I think, of these experiences. I, I love that in the book very much. Hmm. And do you mind me asking me one yes. more question? Before? Yes, sorry, go ahead, please. No, it's as if, as if um, the border revealed itself very quickly, um, that particular border, and I think it's true of all border, um, border zones, is, is not really the binary world that it's constructed to be. It's, it's a kind of labyrinthine world. It's a labyrinth. Um, it, has, it has multiple refractions, not just two sides. And, and, and the voices and the stories within that labyrinth, you know, reflect that kind of uh, that that the nature of, of that world it's it's kind of it's it's many voiced and many faced um, and there are many distorted reflections. Yeah, no, thank you. And actually, I'm going to come to the teacher in just a second. But I had one question just while you're saying that, and it's about the way, not just in your experiential memory of this border as a metaphorical place, but then when you began to write about it. In the process of writing your book, did you have a reflection on how you were writing and not just the kind of language that you use, but the metaphors that you choose, that a militarized zone could be an installation, but equally in your kind of writing, you had choices in how you would represent this haunted journey that you undertook. And did you have you anything to share just with, since we're in a conversation about literature and borders, about the actual practice of writing? In the book border. I guess, I guess, I mean that, yeah, you, you are touching on this kind of, um, yeah, this is the holy grail, I guess, of, of all art is where you are, you are um, <clears throat> ideally aiming for a point where uh, form and content are in, indivisible, where the, really the form is a kind of perfect reflection of, of the material that you are, that you are finding, um, unearthing and grappling with and overwhelmed by at times. Um, and in a way, you know, the, the form of the book was dictated by the form of the land and its, its people, these conversations um, that I was, uh, that I was <clears throat> collecting. Um, yeah, it's, it's as if the, the mountains and the border rivers and um, yeah, even the voices of the dead in a way, these untold stories. Uh, these, yeah, uh, haunted, haunted histories um, dictated this kind of um, rather fluid, um, I don't know, hybrid, hybrid form. I mean, I'm, sh I'm sure Suchitra will have will have things to um, to say about um, the the necessity to be hybrid, to be eclectic or holistic or whatever we want to call it. Uh, when dealing with this kind of labyrinthine uh, reality. Um, yeah, no, thank you, absolutely. And Sushitra, please, I mean, you had this impossible job. I'm also thinking of the scale of the uh, multiple refractions of the Irish border and even of the border in Bulgaria, the Cold War that we're thinking about, but the vastness of the territory that you went through uh, in Midnight's borders, maybe you share with us a little bit about your experience of writing about that. Um. I don't know. It's been. It took me eight years to. Um, the initial the project started with my work in the Afghanistan Pakistan border when I was still a graduate student at Yale, and I got Afghanistan for very different reasons. Um, it kind of goes back to the first question that you asked about when did you first confront the border? For me, it was uh, it was nine eleven um, because two weeks after nine eleven, I got on a flight from Madras um, in in Tamil Nadu in India to a flight uh, to England where I was going to start my undergraduate studies. I was 17. I was, um, the world in some way seemed, I don't want to, I don't want to use the rhetoric that the world had changed. The world hadn't changed in some ways. This violence was pretty much, and everything that happened in the name of war on terror was in some ways a continuum of what uh, many black, brown um, and resisting communities had gone through for many, many years. But as a young person, I felt at loss about what was happening to me. I didn't know what was happening. And in the years that followed became very clear that somehow many of us were different. 
and that our capacity to travel. Um, and I think eloquently, um, you know, um, as you spoke about it, you know, some ways that the journey is one way. Uh, for some of us, that journey was not even one way. We couldn't move. Um, and again, I wasn't thinking about this in terms of borderlands or I wasn't thinking about this. That would come much later. But there was a sense that there was a world that was changing and I wasn't caught in the middle of the change. And how does one write about that? And because 9-11 had become such a looming narrative in Afghanistan and Kabul and images of Kabul and the war on terror and later Iraq became such an important part of the visual memory. One of the things that I said to myself is that I one day wanted to go to Afghanistan and I said, I wanted to understand what was happening. Again, I wasn't thinking of, oh, I will write about this. I wasn't thinking about the Indiana Jones way of parachuting into a world. I simply wanted to understand what had happened to a nation, a people who had been bombed, um, who had been tortured. Um, and in some ways, the American empire had now firmly planted not only its drones and its, its, its foot soldiers, something else had happened. And that's why almost 10 years later, I did go to Afghanistan, but I went there trying to understand. And then that took me to the Afghanistan-Pakistan border. And when I left, I left again thinking that the social world that was narrated to me for 10 years in the years following 9-11 was a very different social world than the one that I was experiencing. I did not see what was being narrated to me on the ground. And increasingly it became clear that then I would have to do the narrating. I would have to do that through images, through writing, through other people's poetry, other people's map. Again, all of the all the while when I was encountering all of this, I never thought this would become a book. I was simply trying to make sense of it. When I came back is when I said, if I returned home, by then I had been away from home for almost 10 years. And I said, what would I find? And also India had changed dramatically in those years. And what would I find of my home? Even the idea of home had become very uh, tumultuous. Um, perhaps my home was now enclosed within the nation state that was becoming territorially aggressive, um, persecuting minorities within its own borders. But more importantly, I felt that I had to make sense of all of this for myself. So again, it, it started with a sense of curiosity, but never with the intention to write. But then writing became a way for me to make sense of the world. I am not a writer who, who I, I don't come from a place where I say, I know this. For me, writing is a way to understand. Um, as you said, sitting with poetry, sitting with other people's texts. Um, even as I was preparing for this conversation, I read, I tried reading all of your books and just the, the way for a writer, um, I think for us, for, for me to exist, I had to be a writer. Um, and I also wanted to kind of read something from some um, Manzur's, um, um, Manzur Arafi has a wonderful new book. Um, he was a young Yemeni boy. He and I were the same age. Um, I was 17 when I left for England and he was 18, he was in Yemen. And he, went, he goes to Afghanistan after um, the bombing and then he gets, he was smuggled. He was kidnapped by warlords and then sold to the Americans to go to Guantanamo. And his book starts with saying, I waited in darkness for death and the interrogators were done with me. You weren't valuable enough to keep alive, they said. So I think borders, I think, existed for all of us. And I think that's how I would think about the idea of the border. So Chitra, thank you. And I suppose, Garrett, can I come to you on that idea then of curiosity and of making sense? Because I suppose when I think, even in the, the local way that I would first have imagined or experienced these things, there was that sense of dissonance of what you had to, ex or how you had expected things to be and how they were in your experience even if you weren't consciously thinking that you had one position or another, that the two things just didn't map up. They had this dissonance all the time. And you have this fascination in the rule of the land with the idea of mapping and cartography and of walking. And I wondered if you would talk a little bit about that extension of your work as a writer into the kind of the embodiment of the experience of walking through the, the border. I'm not sure I would call it necessarily a practice of discovery, but practice of curiosity, perhaps. Would you think that that was a fair way to put it? Yeah, that sounds fair. I mean, they sound quite closely related, discovery and curiosity, I suppose. As regards part of the practice, yeah, I've always thought there was a close connection between maps and texts, you know? Like we use the same verb, you read them both. Uh, and both of them in some 
quite deep way, I think, help you find your find your place in the world. So I suppose that's part of the attraction. Um, making a map that was a really grandiose uh, thing to do. Quite an egotistical thing to presume to present an entire landscape. Like the travel writer sort of goes along and has, has these things that they capture along the way, which is all a person can do with their life. But the person who presumes to make a map of it is probably is probably sticking their neck out a bit further and uh, probably deserves to have it cut off really. But so that's probably what I was doing. I just like the sheer, uh, I just like the, uh, sort of the, the power of cartography. Um, but you also, you had to, there's the, I mean, so Chichu has been talking about, you know, things on the very largest scale and that you're, mm -hmm. One of the things I loved in reading your work was this idea that kind of the bogginess, the muddiness, you keep getting wet and you get lost and you couldn't find your way. Was that also a kind of reflection on the idea of the impossibility, the modesty, really, of the humility? Yeah, I suppose there's two messages going on there, aren't there? There's the kind of the, the there's the there's the claim and the right to map it. And then the text sort of undermines that by keep talking about how terrible I am at it. So as and I suppose there's sort of some kind of uh yeah, the, the texture there hopefully is, is, is sort of enjoyable to read. Uh, but taking you back even a bit further, I mean, you grew up by the border, your father mm. crossed it all the time. Tell me a little bit about what, because even now I'm always surprised even, um, I don't think of myself as being particularly old, but the, the Belfast in the north of Ireland that I grew up in and the experiences of crossing the border that I first remember are tremendously different and almost invisible now to the generation born afterwards. So maybe even for the sake of those readers who are with us, if you don't mind sharing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I was fascinated listening to Cap Killer, especially talking about the emotional uh, quality of her experience of living on one side of the border and people coming in and her not being able to go out. And when I was young, we lived quite close to the border and people who know Donegal will know it's quite a big county, but it's only attached to the rest of the south of Ireland by a very narrow neck. So you've got border almost everywhere. So in a sense, there would be opportunity to feel a bit trapped there. The border was patrolled by the military and there was customs and things. It was very regulated border. But all the same, you know, I don't think I felt it that way. I felt it was like a kind of a doorway into another place, weirdly, despite the fact it was a bit of a process to get through it. You know, you could I mean, you know, soldiers with guns would be asking you questions. And so it was obviously a bit uh, of an ordeal, really. I suppose this party just because I was quite young. Um, it felt to me like it was a sort of an option, a kind of alternative sort of uh, thing that I had. Um, and I think so then I when I was writing my work about Ireland's border, I think I was on that sort of trend. So as you, as you say, the border started to soften from that point on. 1993, we all joined the EU, and so the customs are removed. And then 1998, you've got the peace process, and so the military are shipped off, and the border becomes this completely open landscape. And that kind of, I think that was my attitude to borders, that they were sort of falling, and I could sort of go anywhere. And that, and at some point, I worked out that that's actually privilege, really. And uh, you mentioned a list at the beginning, actually, Nicholas, uh, gender, religion, class, language. And the big one is race, which you didn't mention, which doesn't entirely apply here. But I think I've moved into a situation of seeing borders as, as one of the most significant demarkers of your privilege. To what extent they're important to you, to what extent you're restricted by them, or to what extent you can live sort of transnationally. And, uh, and so uh, somewhere in my own personal development, I've sort of worked that out. I, um, I lived illegally in the United States for a while, you know, I'm talking like 20 years ago. And, uh, and then I was back probably about 10 years after that. I was just, I was, I was getting a collecting site in in Arizona, I had to get out and change the plane, change the plane flights, and uh, so we're queuing up, and myself and a, and nine other people were sort of hived off the queue, and we were put in a different queue, and we could see the big queue over there. We were in this little queue, and we looked at our boarding passes, and we had four big X's on our boarding pass passes, you know, and we're looking, we're talking to one another, showing each other our boarding passes. These four X's look very ominous, you know. <laughs> 
And so what happened with me, I was flagged because I'd lived there illegally before. And they gave me a light grilling and it was fine. I was, I was let to go on. But the striking thing, I was the only white person in that queue, you know. It wasn't. And even the, even the, even the border agent that I spoke to was a bit surprised that he didn't need a translator, you know. It was like, you know, you're a taste in another life there. Yeah, no, no, um, it's, 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 yeah, no, it's a good point to make. And actually, maybe I'll bring in Donald here, because um, even in a literary sense, just thinking back to uh, Kapke's idea of a sense of kind of regulated motion and a sense of relative space in her understanding of the border. And then Sushitra's idea of the idea of stasis and also the idea of forced movement. And then your idea, Garrett, of being somewhere in between those things. And we have all of these gradations. And it's most interesting at the moment, of course, in thinking about the way the border in Ireland is being represented as a place that can be kept open or not, or the degrees to which it's become difficult to cross or to imagine it. That these larger conversations are precisely, they have echoes in this situation at the moment. But Donald, your scholarship has been very much um, about the French imperial experience in North Africa. And maybe you might help us a little bit in thinking, uh, as Sushitra has invited us to, thinking comparatively about these different questions of regulation, these different questions of race, uh, different questions of access to borders, and maybe even giving us, um, we've gone back into recent decades in our conversation, but perhaps even further again, before we come back a little bit more to the present. But I, I think it's quite interesting, you know, I think everybody else has started with kind of a, a personal narrative. So I might just share something that, that, that really came, struck my mind while I was preparing for this, which was, you know, I grew up and um, just came of age kind of just after the peace process and um, very much at a time where the narrative here was, as Gareth said, borders were falling and particularly that the European Union was instrumental in bringing about for, falling borders. Uh, first of all, you know, between the East and West, and then on this island between North and South. So I was really struck when I first traveled uh, to North Africa, to, to Morocco, uh, to see what the European border regime is uh, in practice. So I visited the, the Spanish colonial exclave of Ceuta or Ceuta in Arabic, the city on the top of uh, Morocco uh, that, that remains part of the European Union and part of, um, part of Spain. And I traveled there with two Moroccan uh, friends of mine. The, uh, that was fine, we, we visited the city and then as we were returning, there was the traffic jam. Uh, so they missed their nighttime curfew. So there's a nighttime curfew in, in this city, like in the sundown cities of, of America, that Moroccans from this region, who uh, so the region around the city, they have free travel, uh, visa-free travel during the day to stay with us so they can do the kind of menial labor. Uh, and but they must leave um, by by nighttime. Uh, so we were in this car trying to travel back. They handed out their passports, and the the border guard was berating them, taking them their number. And then when I got out of the car with my European passport, you know, from a territory that's two thousand five hundred kilometers away from this corner of Africa, all of the whole rhetoric changed, and we were let through no problem. And so that really instrument really showed me that, that this narrative that we have um, of, of the European Union as, as making borders fall uh, is just not true outside of the bio, outside of fortress Europe itself. Uh, and if anything, the European Union in, in recent years has made uh, borders in the Mediterranean much harder. And when we're talking about a hard border in the Mediterranean, we're talking about death. We're talking about people drowning in the Mediterranean. Uh, so I think that's something really vital that, that we bear in mind when we talk about these, these topics. Uh, here in Ireland that we have that perspective and that there is a border regime in Ireland that is really, really hard. And that's the border regime at our airports and our ports for people who aren't European citizens. And that, that border regime is in both jurisdictions. Um, it's also a border regime that's in our towns and cities that separates asylum seekers uh, living in direct provision from the rest of us. I have, on my road, there's a direct provision centre down there. There's an effective border between that and, and the rest of the city. So these border regime questions are part of our, our contemporary society, and they do have roots, deep roots, in the racialization processes that took place uh, during the colonial period. Uh, so it's, it's no coincidence uh, that, that certain groups that once, you know, Algeria was once actually uh, a member of the EU, a predecessor of the EU, uh, long before Ireland joined the EU, uh, there's certainly no question of giving free movement to Algerians uh, within the European Union. Uh, and that is connected 
the, this racial heritage that dates from colonialism, um, which as Garrett has pointed out, you know, is, is something that we can sometimes overlook uh, here in Ireland when we talk about borders. I don't know, I can take you on that slightly, um, I suppose another version or take you further in that um, conversation, but just in your own experience, not just in traveling, these, but in reading and thinking about the variety of languages that you come across in your own work. And maybe you'd speak a little bit about the importance, since we're talking about border literatures, um, about the importance of border languages and how we might think about worlds other than the Anglophone and describing things mm -hmm. in the and I'll just hope that might help us as readers to imagine with empathy other places and times. Yeah, I think it's it's um, I think it's a question of language and a question of, of genre. Uh, so there there you know is a focus on certain um, well particularly in the anglophone world certain borders are magnified more than others. Uh, so certainly the the Mexican American border has a, a strong presence in literature for understandable reasons. Um, but, you know, the Mediterranean border is far deadlier in terms of the lives that it costs. And I don't think that looms as large in part because of the languages um, that, that the literature, both scholarly, but also, you know, literary texts is produced in. The other thing I think is really fascinating, which, which my own students respond really well to, is that when we look at genres that are less traditionally, uh, you know, less traditional uh, surrounding um, migration stories. So in particular, you know, if we look at North Africa, the way we can now begin to understand how potential migrants see Europe and how they experience Europe is through their Facebook pages. And there are these fascinating and quite sad Facebook pages uh, where people give advice, but also give list their aspirations uh, for their travels uh, across the Mediterranean. And in a way, they're really rich literary texts. Um, many of them are poems. Many of them are written in, in, in the form of rap songs, but they're not the kind of literary texts that, that are consumed behind the, beyond those communities. So I think there's a lot of work to be done in, in, in trying to make those available uh, beyond those specific communities. I can see one of our uh, audience attendees is Peter Daly has pointed people that wonderful book, The Lost Children, mm -hmm. an example of this. Now, can I come back to Kapka for a moment now? Because Kapka, your book, Borders, um, Border was full also of remarkable phrases. And it struck me that there's something, I mean, certainly in the tradition of literature in Ireland, that the uh, aphoristic, the capture in a few short words, we were joking before that uh, Kapka at the moment is in a hotel room in Paris, and we're hoping that, you know, I was thinking of Oscar Wilde, but I'm sure this will end uh, in a better fashion. But just thinking about this aphoristic way of explaining things, of capturing a moment in just a few words. And you had this beautiful phrase about borders, that it's a place where you pick up the hum of frequencies of the unconscious, that they are thin places. So maybe, you know, we've talked a little bit about the geographical and the political and the global context of borders and the, the very real material effects they have on people. But can I come back to you, Cap, because you write so well about this? Just about this idea that you had of the hum of the unconscious about picking up and maybe also about the, the practice of listening when we've talked a lot about writing and um, we've talked a lot about observing and maybe to a degree we begin to think about the idea of witness in literature but maybe you might tell us a little bit about listening and these ideas of the frequency of the unconscious that you have in border such a beautiful idea well, many of the places that um, that feature in 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 my book um, are not just border border part of the border worlds. They are also part of these exceptional sort of natural uh, realms. You know, these um, more or less unspoiled wildernesses. Some of the last wildernesses of Europe. Um, so the people of the border that I encountered also were people of the mountains and um it was it was almost as if uh, sometimes through a human voice you know you could pick up the the more than human voices of this um you know of this demilitar recently recently demilitarized border zone um, and, you know, one of the many paradoxes and many, many contrasts um, that I was aware of is that the border is a very recent, that particular border is a very recent phenomenon. In fact, the physical installation was built at the same time as the Berlin Wall in the 60s. And prior to that, no physical border had ever existed 
in in this part of the Balkans, um, the south, um, the southeast. Um, the only borders had been natural boundaries, rivers, um, mountain valleys, um, and I just wanted to pick up because you know listening and seeing go together, and I wanted to pick up on the scene that Donald just um, described. Um, you know, a single scene, border scene, can encapsulate so much. So I was crossing uh, from Bulgaria into Turkey in a car with with an acquaintance, and we just crossed. You know, in a in a matter of minutes. At the same time, um, you know, it's as if different dimensions. You know, different destinies were playing themselves out, almost like different points in time at the very same checkpoint which is incidentally the busiest checkpoint in eurasia because all the traffic from asia passes through that checkpoint turkey bulgaria to go into europe um, so it's the busiest land checkpoint i should i should add and at the same time um, there were shoppers um, you know from bulgaria and greece going to shop for the weekend in the nearest turkish city edirne um, while a lorry driver was being busted for having three Syrian stowaways, three young guys. So before our eyes, you know, before, you know, the shopper's eyes and the kind of weekend, you know, um, fun border crosses, you know, Garrett said it's a portal, you know, it's a doorway. There is something thrilling and fun sometimes about stepping through that, through that door. Before our very eyes, we saw, you know, three young guys and the lorry driver's lives uh, change forever. Um, and that's, that's the border for you. Um, it was speechless, you know. Yeah, no, I, that didn't go into the book because there, there, there was simply too much happening <laughs> um, to, you know, to, to include it all. But, you know, I was also interested in hearing the stories of you know the archetype, archetype, the border guard. You know the guardian of the <clears throat> of that kind of liminal space to see what kind of people these guys are. Uh, both the older generation who, under communism, who are under orders to shoot. You know there was this kind of uh, famous border saying. You know the the order is the unofficial order is shoot and then ask questions. And the younger generation who are dealing with um, you know what's happening today um, and this conversation between the two generations you know the old guard and the new guard is quite an interesting one um, yeah it's one of the very uh, difficult moments in the book isn't it whenever the one of the guards he's not quite sure as he said too much and wants to tell you more and there's that sense of reserve and exchange that you know there's a kind of a balance even though none of what is willing to be admitted to but it is kind of a, a moral crime in some sense you get that sense that they well, with the old generation of border guards, you always wonder whether they have killed people, hmm. you know, because often they have. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Suchi, do you mind if I bring you back in? I know you said at the start of all of this, and I disbelieve you, that you didn't, I'm not going to say you didn't approach this as a writer, but that you're not a writer or that you did not describe things in a literary way, because I was struck, you know, there are passages in your book whenever you, well, in the mountains, when you're looking into Pakistan, whenever you go through the Sundarbans, whenever you're thinking about the, the many, I mean, the tremendously uh, varied continental landscapes that you describe, um, that you do so with the, I know your focus is always on the human story, but you have a real attention to the landscape too, which I thought for me, at least as a reader, what grounded the book and what made it so powerful. Would you tell me a little bit about, if you don't mind, about what, I mean, just one of those landscapes that you went through, and of course by the landscape I mean it's, you know, human, it's non-human, it's a live context in the most broad ecological sense, but was there a place that you didn't expect to? I mean, you come from um, one part of India, you've written about many other parts, but, and in a way your idea of what India might have been, I think, changed so much over the book, and there's that great sense of disappointment about what it is, well, there is still hope about what it could yet be. But was there a landscape that still stays with you now, even though while you're very far away from it, you're far away from the book already, you write books, they disappear. Tell us a little bit about one of those places that you thought was thin, where you heard these frequencies that Kafka so beautifully describes. I think when you, I think I, I traveled over, I think over 9,000 miles, um, over eight years 
And one thing that became very clear was that the world changes every hundred feet. And growing up, um, the first time I heard about the border was, was these movies that were made um, where there were movies about India, Pakistan, there were Bollywood movies where um, the landscape was shown in this, as this empty space that, that, that two people were, were battling for. Of course, India was always the moral higher. India was always projected as, um, as, as the, I mean, again, you're talking about Bollywood movies, um, not unlike the American uh, movies that center the story of the soldiers. Um, I think for me, the first landscape that really moved me um, in terms of just how different it was from what I had seen, again, in the visual memory was the Afghanistan-Pakistan border. Um, I was in these smaller bases in Paktika province, which is very far away. And while the U.S., uh, by the time I got there, the U.S. troops had already uh, stopped patrolling. But I had spent a lot of time with the Afghan local police um, and the Afghan National Army that were guarding these places. And what you really saw were women in these communities who knew these landscape um, on the back of their hand, the way in which the landscape moved. Uh, the Sufi shrines that you don't talk about, um, landscape that was changed by over 70 years of uh, unending conflict, ways in which militarization was beginning to show. So what you really existed in front of you was a messy visual image. And I think that kind of carried over everywhere. The India-Bangladesh border, on the other hand, is so alive. Uh, 20 million people live there. Um, there are, you know, um, you cross across, you know, there are, there are houses in which the international border runs right in the middle of the house and you cross. Um, on the other hand, Kashmir is so militarized that I really couldn't trace the border. I had to come back to Srinagar and then go to Udi, come back, come back to my base, go back even... So the militarization then changed the landscape completely. And what was interesting for me was that I had been to Palestine and the occupied territories much before I came to Kashmir and the familiarity of how these two occupied spaces could physically now be transformed. And again, I could go on and on about the landscape because I think the landscape is also a story. The landscape is a breathing, living um, space that not only defines the people who are entrapped within these occupied spaces, and of course the India-Pakistan border is just absolutely different. There are no people. The entire region is completely cleansed, and what you see is heavy militarization. So again, as I said, this just every landscape is so unique and so different, but it, it tells you it's a story onto itself. And Sushita, one thing I enjoyed about the book, that kind of collage effect to try and represent this if not to represent the totality of this differential landscape, but to give you a sense of its fragmentary, refracted nature that Kafka talked about, the, far, the way you took your own photographs. And certainly in Ireland, a photography about the north of Ireland and photography about the border zones has been a way, I think, of making visible these forces. There was a wonderful essay that Colin Graham once wrote about the border installations in Armagh that he described them as erupting. Uh, like Hegelian forces from the subconscious and there's a sense that you know the towers you know they were kind of literal eruptions of these different forces which were imposing upon this geography and I know that Garrett I'm going to come to in a moment and talk to you about Locke Foyle to take us out towards the questions but you know has written as well about these landscapes which are led over much older landscapes even Iron Age forts things that actually map to a degree the modern day border thousands of years later that you have over this overlay but before I come to Garrett and remember Garrett talks about the lock foil and this line um, of demarcation in the water um, and we'll move into questions and then answers so if you have questions please put them in. Donal I wanted to ask you you know, we're talking about these landscapes and um, we're talking about certain kinds of inscription. Uh, we're certain talking also about certain kinds of limit and of impossibility. And I just wondered, you're an academic in the Irish Academy, working a historian, working in a French department, thinking about North Africa. And maybe you would share with us, like just even from your own perspective as a reader, why it's so important to talk about these different perspectives. And even though they may end up with us saying, well, actually that's not quite like Ireland or it's a little like Ireland or it's, you know, the, the qualifications that sometimes people like that. So what's important about making these comparisons? Well, I think it's first of all important to start from the basis that comparison isn't equation. And I think that's what causes controversy and confusion sometimes. And that comparison is just about, is just as much about difference 
as, as it is commonalities. Uh, but what I think we can learn um, from, from comparative approaches is the way that these structures function across time and space. Uh, so rather than saying Irish history is completely distinct from Indian history or Palestinian history or Algerian history, instead we look at the common technologies and structures that are used. So, you know, we've spoken about mapping. Mapping is a technology uh, that is essential, uh, not just to the end of empire partitions, but of course to the conquest at the start. And, you know, we know that from from Irish literature and Brian Fields' translations is one of the great accounts of, of mapping processes that re resonates in India and Algeria as much as it does in Ireland. So I think there's great, you, um, great value in that kind of comparative approach for understanding technologies and structures uh, that are deployed across different spaces and across different times. Within that, you have to recognize the different intensities, uh, temporalities uh, of empire uh, and how it functions and what its legacies are today. Uh, but if we bear in mind that comparison is not equation, then I think we really can learn quite a lot. Uh, and I know my students learn a lot uh, from, from that perspective that they carry into their classes when we talk about borders. Um, we, we talk about the Irish border in one lecture and then move on to talk about the Mediterranean and we, we focus as much on what is different as, as what is common. Thank you, Donna. And Garrett, I was thinking before this uh, conversation began about the many beautiful ways that you describe the border and how well read your, your book is and how well regarded, quite rightly. And I have my own fascination with this idea of water and with coastlines. And I was just thinking about that beautiful description you have of coming towards Loch Foyle as the end of your journey. And maybe just before we move to questions, and please do ask us some questions. I see there are two there already, and I'll come to them in just a moment. Would you give us a sense? We've gone through these large scales of time and place. We've had these beautiful, intimate stories of these you, all of you, sharing with everyone your experiences as writers and, and thinkers and citizens of your different places. But would you mind talking us out in a way, finishing this with this movement you had up towards Loch Foyle as you were finishing your own journey in that phase? You're on mute. Apologies. Uh, that phrase of Kapkas, which you quoted there, frequencies of the unconscious. For me, on the border, what that meant was all the kind of the history that everybody would have picked up about the border, primarily due to violence and trouble. Um, and that's the kind of the that's the kind of the cultural load you've got that you're kind of hearing whisper to you as you walk about. But then it's quite odd because all you're looking at is loads of cows and uh, fields and things. So in a way, you go there to get over the unconscious, to actually see what's actually happening. It's sort of that was part of my mission. And uh, and yes, what you find is actually quite a quite a tranquil sort of bucolic sort of place. And even during the troubles, frankly. In the mid 70s that's mostly what you would have found then as well although there would have been the occasional helicopter going back um and then at the end yes you come to lock foil which is quite a, a large body of water and really quite beautiful and sort of underexplored i think probably because the border goes up the middle of it and so it's people have tended to, to shy away of it because of those unconscious sort of uh troubling questions that the border sort of raises in people's minds, especially people from Ireland, it's kind of slightly, it's slightly, um, it makes you look at your identity in ways that you probably would rather not. Um, so people have tended to steer away from it, like literally steer away from it. Um, but I was following it very closely, of course, this was my mission. And, 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 and so for Loch Foyle, I had to get in a canoe and head up the middle. Um, and it was, well, it was very striking because it was a very calm day. So the sea was like a was like a mirror and the sky was blue. And you had the sense of going into this uh, sensory deprivation tank where you couldn't really see anything around you. And the, and, the, and both both coasts were sort of disappearing into the haze and you're just going out into this blue, you know. But the thing with Loch Foyle is that there nobody really knows where the border is there because officially there is conflict about that. So... Ireland says the border goes right up the middle and the UK says it goes right across to the coast 
And rather cheekily, it actually goes up to the high tide line. So if you walk the beach in Donegal at low tide, and if you walk along the sea, you're actually in the UK officially by, the, by, by their claim. But the reality is, and this says a lot about borders, maybe, is that we just don't talk about it. So that we know there's a fight there, but we don't have to have it. Again, that's privilege, I suppose, isn't it? We don't have to have it. So, so instead, if you look at the map, you'll see the, the black border line heads into Loch Foyle. And after about half a mile, it just sort of dissipates into, into nothing. And uh, yeah, that's where I ended up. Yeah, no, I'm brilliantly so. But of course, you were already entering, as you say in your work, but entering into that place that the Ordnance Survey had begun its mapping from, that you began, you ended your journey where they began. So there's a kind of a... Yes, well, with skills, Donal will know this, with skills learned in India, yeah. I believe, or were they applied in India afterwards? I'm sorry, I haven't looked this up recently. But uh, it was an extremely precise survey, and the baseline was taken from, from the uh, eastern shore of Loch Foyle, which is extremely flat. Yeah. And they were able to get an eight mile straight line there that they then used to plot out sure. the, uh, the rest of the Ordnance Survey of Ireland, which at the time was, was the most precise ever conducted anywhere in the world. Well, between all of these uh, imaginary lines, I want to hold on to that moment of you out there and that greater blue that you saw, because actually one thing I want to and I hope you don't mind me putting it this way, compliment you all on your work is this, I shouldn't say it's a sense of the utopian because it's not in any way detached from reality, but the kind of hopefulness that each of you retained in Suchitra, I really admired that in your book very much, but with all of you, that there was something in the practice of writing and of description, which if it didn't materially overcome the conditions you were describing, it didn't surrender to them. And there was really, and I would hope all the way through this series, a sense of, um, humanity that uh, literary texts can share, even as they're exposing some of the worst kinds of inhumanity. And I think that you, all of you are conscious of that uh, push and pull, that motion and stasis that we've talked about. And that, that sense of witness, I think, was very powerful in all of your work. And sometimes it might be out there uh, offshore, alone in the fog, wondering where the next uh, motion will come from, but still you persisted. So thank you for that. Uh, we have a wonderful question from my dear friend, Eve Patton in the Long Room Hub in Trinity. And it says in your book, Kafka, you reference two OED descriptions of a border, the line that separates countries and the strip around the edge or something, which weirdly also has this association of adornment, doesn't it? Which is a peculiar thought. And Eve would be interested to hear, and it's for anyone, to how these two meanings resonate with the various experiences the other speakers have described. And does the edge of something apply in the Irish context, so are we at the edge? Is the border a strip around, or I suppose is Eve asking, is it also a line between? I mean, did you think much about dictionary definitions when you were walking around since you're all worried about maps and cartography and scientific declensions? And you're all writers, you're meant to disregard these things, Katka. Oh, um, <clears throat> I suppose um, the Bulgarian word um, and generally the Slavic word um, for border granica is something I grew up with and it was all, it always had a sinister ring. So when I started writing about this, um, I kind of looked up the, um, the, the, you know, the official definition. <laughs> for me, granica simply sounds like a, you know, like a horror film in one word. But, um, you know, th there is this what I, yeah, what we touched on already is this ambiguity, the ambiguity, is this a delight and a thrill or am I, you know, or, or is this a sinister experience? So the border is, is always a kind of um, a place of ambiguity. Uh, and I suppose the easiest, perhaps the most um, uh, visual way to think about this is um, to to, to realize that most border walls are pointed in one direction or another. So the top of the barbed wire or the rolled wire, the modern technology uses more rolled wire, barbed wire rather than pointed like the, um, the Iron Curtain actually had the barbs turned inwards, uh, which I think is very symbolic of what a border does. You know, it's supposed to protect us from incomers, but actually it's turned inwards 
forever, you know, looking for the enemy within, because that's what a border, border culture creates. It creates a perpetual search for the enemy within. Um, and I think that's an image that kind of says it all about um, the inside and the outside of the border. Thank you. Would anyone else like to jump in? And we also had a question. Garrett, did you want to say something? Well, yeah, just on the idea of the edge, yeah. I mean, we have such, the Irish border is such a soft example that uh, we, we can we can sort of, we have the luxury of, 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 I have the luxury in my book of just refusing to treat it as an edge and just, and actually just opening that up and blowing it up and saying, no, it's a place in itself. And really that's the primary mission of, of, of the entire book is to take a problem and, and make it into a place. Um, but then, as we're hearing from Capcan, and, and 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 as we know, every time we switch on the news, there are a lot of boards that actually are edges, and uh, and and an extremely meaningful. Um, referencing again, Capcan's description there a while ago of of the border and seeing how all these different people were having these different uh, experiences there, that really struck me as as um, as as when you meet that edge, because everyone approaches the border kind of the same, but then they get there and it's a filter of a sort. And and you get your you get thrown into your strata at that point. You get you get told where you belong and what your rights are, um, and uh, so and that's part of the the traumatizing power of them to kind of let you know your place. Thank you. And Donald, did you want to say something before we wrap up? Yeah, I do think that in terms of the Irish border being an edge, you know, if 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 you're someone like me who grew up. I grew up an hour from the border, but very much in, in the south. The, the, the border still remains considered to a certain extent an edge, um, and particularly the lands around the border. You know, this kind of, you know, deeply problematic trope that the, the border lands, whether it's Donegal or Dundalk or, you know, Quinn country, that these are areas where there is no law um, or across the border in South Armagh, and th this is the edge of something the edge of a state, whether it's the northern state or the southern state. And I do think that persists even you know, for someone like me who grew up post, you know, basically the physical infrastructure of the border was largely gone. Uh, and, and it's a trope that I'm sure uh, really irritates people who grew up along the border or live by the border. But it's one that is fairly persistent, at least in southern mainstream society, and is extended to a certain extent to the whole of the north and to border counties this idea of difference and, and lawlessness, um, you know, that, that's very much rooted, uh, you know, a cultural partition that's very much rooted in, in, in attitudes in the South. So one of the things that I, I was hoping for uh, this evening and over the next coming months for this whole series was a sense of um, shared information, uh, further discussion, that one of the things I think that partition has achieved in Ireland is a sense of distance between people who live in different parts of the island, no matter whether they think they belong to that island or not. And it's not for me to say whether they should or should not, but simply to try and make those distances smaller and to help share some languages and images from other cultures and places that are have been separated for different historical reasons and to see some commonality perhaps and maybe by not thinking always that the north of Ireland is specific in one particular way, is always abject in one particular way, that we might find the space to think about a better future for all the citizens of the island of Ireland. And to do that in an awareness that we have much to work on in our own society to make it more fairer, more open and more inclusive. And I think that Kapka, Suchitra, Garrett and Donald, you've helped us very much in that conversation this evening. I want to thank Sandra and all our friends at the National Library again. I enjoyed this conversation so much. I am confirmed again in my belief that reading is one of the great practices of liberation and as writers you help in that practice uh, daily. So I thank you for it. And to go back to Donald's final point about borders and this idea of violence and the imagination of it as being a, a troubled place. We're going to take that in a slightly different direction for our first book reading, which is going to be on Wednesday, the 20th of October at seven o'clock Irish time, where Neil Hegarty and Elizabeth Mannion are going to describe or talk about Andrea Carter's noir, Death at Whitewater Church, an Inishowan mystery set in Donegal, 
which will be moderated by my good friend, the great uh, Scottish crime writer and academic, Liam McIlvany. So that's on Wednesday, the 20th of October at 7 p.m. Well, I want to thank you all very much for being here today with us. Thank you very much for all the wonderful uh, suggestions in the chat that were there for books to read. So indeed, we have generated uh, further books to read. And then, of course, is the other great benefit of reading, which there is no end to it. But I appreciate very much all your engagement. Kapka, I wish you all the best with your book launch for your new book, Suchitra. It's been such a pleasure to get to know you and to read your work. Thank you, Garrett. I've admired your work for such a long time. And Donald, thank you for always being so insightful, bright, and good company. But for this evening, that's a good night from me and good night from the National Library of Ireland. Thank you all. <laughs>